that is trying to convince us to not look at God's way. And especially when it has to do with you. Who are you? What do you say about you? What do you think about you? We're going to be looking at those things tonight because once you go in that spiral of self-bitterness, you're going to find out that the enemy just loves to kill, steal, and destroy your, your self-worth, your health, your relationships. So let's look at how that sounds and what that looks like. I'm going to read a little scripture to start with. Listen to this one. This is from Matthew 5.5. 5. And this is from the message. We use a whole lot of different translations here. I like this one. Listen to, listen to the self part of this one. You're blessed. This is the Beatitudes. This is the... Foundations? Yeah, come on in. This is foundations. Yeah, this is biblical foundations of freedom. No, that's all right. We're just happy you're here. You are blessed when you are content with just who you are. No more, no less. That's the moment you find yourself proud owners of everything that cannot be bought. So take a minute right now just to think about, are you content with who you are? Because that's, you have a right to be content. All right? Who do you say you are? Do you call yourself a saint? God calls you a saint. Do you call yourself a sinner who never, hardly ever gets it right? Or do you call yourself a saint who sometimes gets it wrong? Because there's a huge difference in those two. It's all about who are you agreeing with. Because Satan wants to call you a nothing. He wants to call you a loser. Do you call yourself more than a conqueror? Do you call yourself strong because he is inside you is strong? It's really important that you start discerning, noticing what you say about yourself. Because God's saying something about you, the enemy is saying something about you, your choice about which one you agree with is very vital to your health, for one thing. I want to read a few, uh, a list of some autoimmune diseases. Have you heard of that word, autoimmune diseases? They are diseases where you t your body turns on itself. So your health is very closely related to your thoughts. Your thoughts tell your brain what to do. Your brain is telling your body what to do. And that's why in 3 John it says that uh, as your soul has a good journey, your body has a good journey. So we're going to look at things that are in our thoughts that contribute even this is so interesting everybody know what the American Medical Association is it has nothing to do with God <laughs> okay but the American Medical Association says that over 90 percent of all illnesses are thought based did you call that self-induced thought based, thought -based? yeah self yeah See the very thing you're, you've heard, you might have heard of the audit, the uh, neuroplasticity of the brain. That work that can work for you or against you. Here's a way that it can work against you: self-induced. Okay. Let's say that you um, do something, you you make a mistake, and instead of forgiving yourself right away, which is God's design, God God is forgiveness. His nature is forgiveness. He wants you to be forgiving. But if you do not do that and you replay that mistake that you made, you replay that, that maybe it's awful, maybe it was an awful thing that you did, but you replay it, guess what happens in your brain? Your brain does not know the difference between whether you're thinking about it or whether you're actually doing it again. So let's say you do it once, but you think about it ten times. You have now reinfected yourself with that same ick that you took on when you did it the first time, and now you've reinfected yourself, and now it's as if you have done it 11 times. You only did it once. But that's the neuroplasticity of the brain. That's how it works against you. But how it works for you is you forgive yourself. 
and you learn to make that your first response when you recognize the sin in your life or you recognize something that you did that was that um, you kept, you wish you had not done. You know what? When you wish you had not done something, you know what that's called? Shame. Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it goes to shame. Sometimes regret. Picture a life without regret. We have the right to live a life without regret. Want to know more about that? That's what tonight is about. You can be regret free. God has given you the right to do that. And we're going to look at how we do that. So, some common autoimmune diseases, Crohn's disease, some cancers, diabetes, lupus, MS, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, Alzheimer's, shingles, hives, roseola, roseola uh, psoriasis, aut some autisms, Graves' disease, Hashimoto's, Sjogren's, and etc. Okay, these are autoimmune diseases. In Luke, 4, Luke 24, 39, it says, For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. That's Jesus talking. And right there, he's talking to us that there's a spirit world. And the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 4, 18, it says, Set your eyes. Set your mind, set your eyes on the things that are spiritual. So what I want you to do tonight is picture yourself as a vessel. The scripture says you're an earthen vessel and you carry spirits. And when you are when you ask the Lord to be your Savior and you want to be and you want to follow Him, you and you ask His Holy Spirit to come into you, you get a sealing, you get a covering, a a cover, like think of saran wrap. I like to think of it that way. A, a, a seal on your vessel. Now, nothing comes in unless you agree with it spiritually. And anything that you have in there already that got, comes out when you repent. So you manage the spiritual life of yourself. And you do that by noticing what spirits you are carrying, how do you notice? What are you manifesting? Now, honestly, it took me three times through this class to understand what manifest meant. <laughs> I always thought manifest was just something that evil did. <laughs> okay? Now I know that manifest means anything that you are putting out whether it's your words that come out of your mouth, whether it's your facial expression, whether it's your body language, your, your words, it's, it's how you're acting, how you're thinking, because whatever you, the scripture says that as a man thinks in his heart, so we are. So And, and whatever it comes out of our mouth is going to tell us what's in our heart. And the scripture calls spirits by their by their manifestation, by their characteristic. God's nature, his characteristics, attributes, traits, or his nature. Satan's nature is his characteristic, his attributes, and his traits. What's your nature? Character, attributes, and your traits. Right. Characteristics, attributes, traits. Can you name your characteristics, attributes, and traits? And can you know, do you know what category they're in? As an example, um, before I came to Wellspring, I thought that fear was just something that we all do. I thought it was normal. In fact, I ministered to a man today who was starting college, and he says, well, you know, I'm just sort of, I'm nervous. I'm nervous about college. You know, that's normal. And he said, um, I said, yeah, in the world that's normal, but God said, do not fear. So what are you going to choose? The world's normal of psychology that has no God in it, or God's normal, which says do not fear. The cool thing about God and the cool thing about this ministry and this class is you get to choose. We're not here to tell you what to choose. We're here to remind you that you have choice. That's why we ask you, start using the word choice. 
Stop using have to, need to, got to, and should, and start using the word choice. What do I choose to do? Because the power for overcoming self-bitterness is in the choice. It's in the place, it's in the realm of choice. That's where the power is. God said, I didn't give you the spirit of fear, I gave you power, love, and a sound mind. And um, in, in my own life, I can tell you that I had all, all kinds of stuff that was happening in me because of fear. And then one day, here, I learned fear is a sin. And my, I can remember, it's like my eyes popped open. <laughs> it's like all of a sudden I could see clearly something that I had never seen before. That I was doing something that I didn't need to do. I was doing something that was a choice that I was making. I was doing something that I could change because I had the power of the Holy Spirit to change anything that I chose to do that was what he's telling me, choose this day to do so that he can bless. It was like, it was an electrifying moment for me and I was, um, like sharing the word because I know that happens with people all throughout the day is that when you hear truth, sometimes it's a, sometimes it's a jarring thing in the moment. Sometimes it's three days later. <laughs> you know? So there's no right and wrong moment of learning, but sometimes it takes another person to water the seed that's planted. You know, but just keep your, uh, you know, as we, as you, as you go through the class, keep asking, keep sharing. That's why we start out by saying, hey, did anybody um, catch an accusing spirit this week? Did anyone um, forgive somebody that annoyed them instead of carrying the bitterness with them? Those are the kind of things when you start sharing those testimonies, they're very ministering to other people. An accusing spirit will accuse you and try to get you to hate yourself and try to put you down. Now, I like, I want to give you this picture of a way that you can handle accusing spirits. Everybody's been to a swimming pool, a public swimming pool where there was a lifeguard, and the lifeguard had a whistle. <laughs> and what happens? That lifeguard is watching. That lifeguard is not asleep. That guard, lifeguard is ready to blow the whistle and point at the person who's running, right? You, stop it. Think of yourself as the lifeguard of your thoughts. Think of yourself as blowing the whistle and pointing and saying, that was an accusing spirit. I did that today. Hallelujah. I said, stop. Hallelujah. Yes. Great. And I had to say it a couple times. Okay. I said, stop. You stop. Okay, now, add to that. That was perfect. Yeah. However, telling the spirit to stop does not set you free. Okay. What sets you free? The truth. So, I, so your next step, your weight on your weight, your weight on your weight, the next step is to speak the truth. Because when you're, when you are overcoming the enemy with the word of God, you are speaking truth. And that is what sets you free. The truth sets you free. That's why we need to know, we need to have the word in us. We need to have it just coming out of our mouth. We need to have it in our hearts so that we can answer with the word. That doesn't mean bump anybody over the head with a Bible. <laughs> that means speak truth. Because God's word never comes back empty. And whether they receive it that moment or not, what, you, what we do is we plant the seed of truth. And God's kingdom is a seed kingdom. It grows. It gets watered and then it grows. And then sometimes... I, I try and grow tomatoes and sometimes I forget to water them and they they completely look like they're dead. And then it's like, oh, I'll put some water on them, you know, and then they perk up. And kind of think of that's how God's, can, you know, you, you can have the word in us and then we forget to water it with the living water. And then it looks like it's all, and then we start feeding it again and it perks up. 
Because remember, Satan wants to steal the Word of God right out of your heart. And so he wants to put his Word in you instead of God's Word in you. And he wants to do it especially of self self bitterness. 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7. So, be content with who you are. And don't put on airs. God's strong hand is on you. He'll promote you at the right time. Live carefree before God. He is most careful. So part of what you want to do is you want to give your cares to the Lord. Give your cares to Him. In Psalm 55, 22, here's what He says. Cast your cares on Him. He will sustain you. And He will never, I love these verses that have old kind of words, never let the righteous be shaken. Now what that tells me is that whenever I get shaken over something, I have stepped out of righteousness. So one thing that we say here when we find this place where we're going to pray, who knows what we say? We say, hallelujah. <laughs> okay? And the reason we say that is we don't want any guilt, shame, condemnation, or regret to be put on you. We want only the celebration of, hey, I just found the answer to the situation. I just found out, I just was reminded that I stepped out of the kingdom to hate myself. I can't be standing in the kingdom of God to put myself down. I need to be in the kingdom for forgiving myself. Okay, But putting myself down, I have to step out of the kingdom for that. And so that, that decision to pay attention, in Proverbs 4.1 he says, Pay attention in order to gain and know intelligent discernment of spiritual matters. So pay attention. So what we, what we want to do this week is start noticing what spirits you're carrying. What spirits are behind the words that you're using. And you're going to have a revelation often about what's going on. Um, I remember working with a lady who said, oh my goodness, I got the rev I got the understanding when I started noticing that after every, every morning for about an hour, all I do is put myself down. I look in the mirror and I put myself down for every morning. And that discernment when she had her eyes opened to what she was actually doing and thinking about herself changed how she handled her life. And that's what's going to happen as we go through this. You'll see. Think of why. Because, yeah. I remember one lady that shared that testimony, and then she said after she quit doing that, her back pain went away. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. When I quit doing that, I, a whole lot of things changed in me. And another lady, this man right here, Mylon, he taught his mirror a new language. <laughs> okay. <laughs> His mirror used to talk ugly to him. <laughs> and his mirror doesn't talk like that to him anymore. That was part of his testimony. And we see we share those testimonies because God a test the word testimony means whatever God did for one, he's gonna do for another. Because God is not partial. Do you know what partial means? Arbitrary. Arbitrary. That's a good word. The scripture says God is not arbitrary. God is not partial. And then it also says uh, it, that partiality is a sin. So, let me ask you this. Do you find it really easy to forgive other people, but you have a really hard time forgiving yourself? Mm -hmm. I think it's just the opposite of me. The opposite? You, <laughs> find, you find it easy to forgive yourself? Okay, okay. Well, hallelujah, we found our first prayer. So let's pray. I would like permission to lead you in a prayer because I want to share with you the Wellspring prayer. We're going to ask, we're going to tell God, we're going to repent for being partial, whether you're partial towards yourself or against yourself. And then we're going to um, 
See, when you become, when you are partial, you give the Satan a legal right to enter you and torment, cause problems. In other words, all right. So then we're going to break that legal right with the blood of Jesus. It's like a contract that you make. But the blood of Jesus and the name Jesus and repentance, they break that contract. And then we're going to ask for healing, and then we're going to listen uh, for the truth, because the truth is what sets us free. Okay? So let's pray. Father, I confess to you in the name of Jesus. Father, I confess to you in the name of Jesus. I have been partial. I have been partial. I've found it easier to forgive. I have found it easier to forgive others or the other way around than myself. I thank you that I am forgiven. I thank you that I am forgiven. I'm no longer willing to be partial. Because you have forgiven me. I forgive myself. In the name of Jesus and by the power of his blood, I cancel Satan's power in this issue. I cancel Satan's power in this issue. Holy Spirit, heal my heart, renew my mind, and tell me the truth about this. I see you and I love you. Ah, yes. That's God speaking. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Anyone else want to share? You are good. You are very good. Yeah. You're agreeing with your Father in heaven. Yes. Do you agree with him? Yeah. Okay. Anyone get a song? A verse? A sensation? A knower? A hope? Notice what kinds of things are occurring. Some people say, well, I don't get it. I don't get why I got this, but I got this. And I say, just say it. It may be another prayer or two, and you'll figure it out. It'll be put together for you. The important thing is you start to pay attention to what happens. Somebody who is, is constantly filled with speculation and accusations and judgments, and there's a bunch of noise going on in their head at all times, and then they pray, and all of a sudden they get nothing. Oftentimes that's... You just experience the peace of God that passes understanding. <laughs> that's a quiet, that's a stillness. And so it's important that you start naming what's going on with you because that's going to help you in that road to freedom. So uh, we are looking at the principality. We looked at self-bitterness towards, towards other people last week. We're going to look at self-bitterness tonight. And then we're going to look at jealousy and envy. Rejection, fear, occult practices, and unbelief. Because these are the areas that anything that you're dealing with, any pain in a memory, any issue going on, is going to fall into one of these categories. These are called the principalities. So we're going to look at definition of self. Your own self. It's you. It's your uniqueness. You are designed by God to uh, be made in His image, which does not mean you look like Him. It means you are designed to have His characteristics, attributes, and traits. So it's even actually easier to live life His way than it is to go against your, your basic nature once you ask Him into your heart. God says you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Now let's take a minute right here to talk about fearfully and wonderfully made. Because part of self-bitterness oftentimes people fall into is something called perfectionism. You ever heard of that term? It's a term that is, is a worldly term. It's not a, it's not a scriptural term. And it's a, it's a, it's a uh, term that means I have to do it perfect or else I'm no good. 
And the problem with perfectionism is it wasn't designed by God, so there's no forgiveness in it. But the really cool part about the words fearful and wonderfully made, when you go back and you look at the Hebrew roots of those words, in both of those words have the word excellence in them. You're designed by God for excellence. And part of excellence, failure is built into it. Failure, then forgiveness, then comes wisdom, because you learn from that mistake, you get up and you try again and you learn and you go forward and you learn. And that process is very different than beating yourself up because you didn't do it perfectly. You're fearfully and wonderfully me. Do you say that about yourself? Because this is about coming into agreement with your father, coming into agreement with your maker. He calls you the apple of his eye. And that is a idiom that means he pays attention to you. He knows you by name. He knows how many hairs are on your head. I see you. Yeah. <laughs> he says, I see you. Absolutely. Yeah. One time I was working at, at cleaning hotels and um, had to do a lot of cleaning in the bathroom. There's lots of hairs in the bathroom. And one day I was sitting there cleaning and I thought, if God numbers the hairs on a head, I'll bet he knows who cleans them up too. <laughs> and he said he's created, we're created in his image. So you're actually designed to forgive. To forgive yourself, to forgive others. To put it behind, you know, let's talk about, since we're going to be doing a lot of self-forgiveness tonight, let's stop right now and talk about how does God forgive. When does he forgive and how does he forgive? When, just like when you asked him into your heart, was in the prayer. And when you ask God to forgive you because he loves you and because you asked and because it's his nature to forgive, he forgives you right then and there. That's when. Now let's talk about how. How does he forgive? He puts it behind his back to remember it no more. He puts it as far as the east is from the west. Mm -hmm. So you're actually designed to forgive in the same manner. Now there are a lot of people who say, yeah, I forgive them, but... And then you go over and talk about them again. That's not the kind of forgiveness that God has designed us to forgive. Once we say, I'm deciding to forgive, the true forgiveness is put it behind your back and don't put it, don't put it back in your memory. So if God has forgiven you, he's put it back there, and you've forgiven yourself, you've put it back there, and that you hear something in your head, who is that? What voice is that? It's the enemy's voice. It's the enemy trying to get you to go back into condemnation. And that's when you lifeguards, you blow the whistle. <laughs> and you point at it and you say, no, you're an accusing spirit. I make no agreement with you. I say it out loud. I still say it out loud. In fact, I take, a, I take some pleasure in finding those things. And here's why. Satan is called the ruler of the world. His spirits, his accusing spirits, they have a right to be in the world. They have a right because Satan's the ruler of the world. But they don't have a right to be in us unless we say, yeah, come on in. I'm willing to hate myself. I'm willing to bring up, a, I'm willing to keep a record of wrongs against myself. What is love? What's the definition of love? Love keeps no record of wrongs. If you have an unloving spirit in you, you will notice that you're keeping a record of wrongs. And if you're keeping a record of wrongs, do you want to continue to do that? Because if you don't want to continue to do that, you can get rid of that spirit, that called an unloving spirit. You can say, I'm not, I'm not willing to put up with you anymore. Anybody have a record of wrongs keeper in them? Would you like to pray? Hallelujah. Yeah. All right, let's pray. Father, I confess to you in the name of Jesus. Father, I confess to you in the name of Jesus. 
I keep, I've been keeping a record of wrongs. I've been keeping a record of wrongs. Against myself and others. Against myself and others. Forgive me. I know that unloving spirit is not from your kingdom. I'm no longer willing to put up with that unloving spirit. I release myself from the unloving spirit that keeps record of wrongs. In the name of Jesus and by the power of his blood. I command those unloving spirits that keep records of wrongs. Leave me now. Never return. Holy Spirit, fill the place where the unloving spirits used to be. Renew my mind. Tell me the truth about this. Sure. I just see um, I just see this drama and and um, and the protection from um, others. Okay. Yeah, she said she feels she's the strong and the protection of it. Yeah. God is our protector. And we have a right to that protection. But along with rights are responsibilities. And we have a responsibility to name the spirits we're manifesting and deciding whether we want to keep them or not and getting rid of them <coughs> using the name Jesus, the name above all name, the blood of Jesus, and the, the, the every knee must bow to the name. And then our job is to guard, guard, keep track, notice what's going on in us. Yeah. All right, let's continue. Do you call yourself very good? God called you very good. Right? So, self bitter. Any way you belittle or put yourself down. We are here tonight to disrupt the culture of self bitterness, and put-downs. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, the, first of all, we have to um, acquire good sense is to love yourself, it says in Proverbs. Okay, so we're going to love ourselves. Now, remember, love isn't an ooey-gooey feeling. Love is a choice. Love is a decision. Your soul is made up of your thoughts, your feelings, and your choices. Love is the choice. It has nothing to do with feelings. It has everything to do with choice. The world will tell you it's that little feeling you get, but that is actually scientifically called limerence. <laughs> and limerence, yes, and it comes and goes. Yeah. Love is a covenant decision that does not come and go unless you change your thinking. And notice a very important thing about your thoughts because God said take every thought captive. He did not say take every feeling captive. Why? Even though your feelings are one-third of your soul, Feelings are amazing. They're very important. But they are not your captain. <laughs> they are not the cap to be followed. They are to be used as a GPS. You know what a GPS is? 
It's a thing that tells you where you're standing. It's right, it's the electronics in your phone that tells you where you're at. So righteousness, peace, and joy, peace and joy are to be used as your GPS to tell you whether you're standing in the kingdom of God or not. Because righteousness, peace, and joy through the Holy Spirit is your indicator. So what's in the way of your joy? What's in the way of your peace? Because if you have decided, I'm not going to have joy and peace until something else happens, then we need to look at what you're looking at to get your joy and peace. Because God said, you have a right. You have a right to joy and peace. But it comes by doing God your, the responsibility of living a right way with God so that He can bless you. Because the blessings, when we teach this stuff, we teach this stuff to kids, right? Which do you choose? We have a rug. We call it the kingdom rug. And we teach kids, and then we throw, uh, we put hearts because God's heart is love. We put hearts on the rug, and we teach them how to stand in the kingdom. And if you're, you can hate yourself if you want to, but you have to stand over here. <laughs> Because the scripture says everything is permittable, but only some things are profitable. God says you choose. He turns us over to our own devices. He lets us choose. It's so important that you celebrate free will, that you thank God for your free will, that you remind yourself often that you get to choose. And if you're choosing death, if you're choosing cursing of yourself, then God said, okay, I would like for you to not choose that, but you get to choose. And that decision that you make to decide to follow it God's way, I want to encourage you to do it God's way. Don't be a stubborn Greek. You know what that means? <coughs> we have been raised in a Greek culture. And the Greek mindset is very different than the Hebrew mindset. Jesus is Hebrew. The word of God is written by Hebrews to Hebrews. We get grafted in to Israel. So let's tweak how we think. The Greek mindset, the actual word for pray is beg and ask. Oh God, please take this self-bitterness away from me. Oh God, that's a begging prayer. Alright? The, the Greek mindset is if you can explain it well enough, clear enough, I might follow. I might test it out. That's kind of the Greek mindset. The Hebrew mindset, on the other hand, is do it. You'll figure it out. You'll see it. It's kind of the Nike, just do it. <laughs> okay. If we get that mindset of, let's just do it God's way. Let's go for the blessing. Let's go for the truth. It's a shortcut. <laughs> it's a shortcut to freedom. It's a shortcut to good relationships, good health, a hope that doesn't disappoint, the truth that sets you free. So taking every thought captive is really... The one thing I'm going to leave you with. Take your thoughts captive. That means, if you could, put every thought onto a piece of paper, and then you're going to file it. And you're either going to file it in the God box or the Satan box. And find out at the end of the day how many thoughts you have that agreed with your God. And tomorrow, decide you're going to have more. And pretty soon you're going to make it a habit of believing God's way and you're going to see. You're going to know the truth. And that word know, that means you're going to have a personal experience. And so those people who say there is no God, you can say, well, okay, but I have a God that's real. My God has healed my heart. He has given me life where there was death. He has changed my relationships. So, I quit belittling myself. 
And that's, let's pray right here. Okay? We're going to repent for belittling ourselves. Father, I confess to you in the name of Jesus. I have participated in belittling myself. I ask you to forgive me. I repent. I am no longer willing to put myself down by belittling myself. In the name of Jesus, that self-bitterness spirit must leave me now. In Jesus' name and by the power of his blood, I command the tormentors that were assigned to me. When I chose self-bitterness, to believe now, Holy Spirit, fill the place where the self-bitterness used to be. Renew my mind. Tell me the truth. What's happening? Lots of things happen, and if you were in one on one ministry, we would sit and talk about what actually was happening. Because it's very important that at the end of each prayer, you start to practice noticing and sharing. You know, sometimes you don't want to share in a big group. And sometimes some things aren't even appropriate, but that's okay. When something occurs, it's important. Because you've asked the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will tell you the truth. And the truth is going to set you free. Because grace is a divine empowerment to do what God has said is right. We have everything we need to lay aside our old self with its evil practices of putting ourselves down. In second or in Colossians 3 9 it says, stop doing that stuff. Lay that stuff aside because you have the power of the Holy Spirit. You have everything you need to stop putting yourself down. All right? So, we are required to love ourselves. God said, love God, love yourself, love others. Satan says, accuse God, accuse others, and accuse yourself. Which do you choose? You have to choose it every minute of every day. Don't think that you can go through 13 sessions with us and have it licked. Some of us have been coming for many, many years. And we just get better and better at it. We get better and better at being victorious over the enemy because the, the scripture says that the enemy is looking for unstable souls. And the scripture says that if you're following God one minute and then you're following the enemy one next minute and then you're following God the next minute and then you're following, you know what this is called in scripture? Double-minded. <laughs> and it says when you're double-minded... You're unstable in all of your ways. And the scripture tells us that Satan is looking for people who have unstable souls. He's enticing. You know what enticing means? Psst, come over here. Do it my way. He's tempting. And you are either going to be so convicted that God's way is right, or you're going to be listening to the tempter say, Psst, come over and do it my way. And you're going to start calling yourself dumb or stupid or unwanted 
or never amounting to anything or on and on and on and on. There's a really cool chapter in this book, chapter 6, how to recognize and get done with self-bitterness. And to prepare for the lesson, I, uh, because I've read it many times, this time I decided to just make a list of all the prayer points. And you know I've got five pages of prayer points. And if you're saying, yeah, my dad's right, I'm never going to amount to anything, that would be an example of self-bitterness. That's one example. If you want that hand out, I'll be happy to share it. But the greatest commandment is love yourself as you love other people. If you don't, if you love God and you love others, but you don't love yourself, it's like having a three-legged stool and it's going to fall over because one leg is short. Because that stool has to have you loving yourself. And it's called obedience. God is asking you to do that. You get to choose whether you're going to do it or not. And Paul tells us why we don't do it. Paul says in, in this Romans uh, verse, he says, why am I doing this stuff that I don't want to do? And then he answers himself. He says, oh, it's not me. It's the sin inside me. In other words, it's that self-bitterness spirit that has taken up it's think of it your your vessel is kind of like real estate and you sell off part of your promised land when you give the devil a place and the scripture says don't give the devil a place he'll torment you he wants to kill still and destroy you and so the cool thing is you may have sold off some of the real estate to the devil but you can take it back you take it back with repentance and forgiveness. Yeah. Um, this kind of goes back to obedience. Okay. So I used to say that um, first comes obedience and then comes the blessing. Mm -hmm. I have that written in my book. Yeah. And I always think about that. You know, Beautiful. Am I living in obedience? Is that why I'm not getting, you know, making progress? But, yeah, first comes obedience and then the blessing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unfortunately, many of us were raised in places where they said, all you have to do is say, I believe in Jesus. And you don't have to do anything else. But then, we start reading the word ourselves. <laughs> and we find out that that's a lie from the enemy. That the truth is, obedience is required. That God said he cannot bless us unless we are choosing obedience. He said, if you love me, you will obey me. And uh, I've heard people say that obedience is God's love language. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's a way of showing that you're loving. But if you, uh, you don't forgive yourself for mistakes, you have an old nature. We're born with an old nature. We're actually born sons of disobedience. In other words, we're born with a spirit uh, that does not follow the Lord. We have to choose to follow the Lord and ask His Spirit to come into us. And then we go on this journey from baby to, uh, from our old nature to baby new in Christ to children to maturity. And maturity does not have anything to do with age. It has everything to do with following, with following the Lord. Obedience. Obedience of manifesting his nature. And it says from glory to glory we are being transformed into the image of Christ. And so, hallelujah, we get to pray. We pray a lot. Because as you pray, you get transformed. Yes? Somewhere else in the Bible it says that we are the righteousness of God or the righteousness of Christ. Right. Right. That we have the mind of Christ. As well. Right. And that um, when we start deciding to manifest that and believe that and use the power of the grace, which is sufficient to transform us, we find our nature changes. And what happens then is you respond very differently. When, when you have an unoffendable heart, you have a very different response to someone who says something 
absolutely horrendous to you. <laughs> Where before, I would want to set them straight. Yeah. Now I quickly forgive. And I want to tell you one of the things that is so precious um, in my own life is because we used to be, my husband, I've been married 40 years to Robert, and um, we used to beat each other up all the time with our mistakes. We would point out each other's mistakes. We would remind each other of our mistakes. We would uh, be pretty ruthless. And I want to tell you now, after Wellspring and uh, submitting ourselves to this, this lifestyle, now when I make a mistake, my husband says to me, can I lead you in a prayer to forgive yourself? Just like that. That's just the first thing that comes out of his mouth. And I want to tell you, that is precious. And I've tried it both ways, and I can tell you which is better. <laughs> and what, what that does, forgiveness, stops you from, stops me, stopped me from replaying what an idiot I was. Okay? How could I do that? Which is what I used to do. And so once you forgive yourself, that kind of stuff stops because that is called imitating Satan. That's called, a, that's called sin. That's called giving Satan a legal right because whatever you say, the scripture says whatever is coming out of your mouth, you're going to eat the fruit of it. And so notice what's coming out of your mouth. Because if you're cursing yourself, you get it. We reap what we sow. Right. Right. And I was flippant with my words. And now I have a right to remain silent. <laughs> I have a right to forgive quickly. And it's a totally different, it's a totally different lifestyle. Because if we don't, here's what happens. This is Satan. He's the ruler of the principalities. And we're looking tonight at the principality of bitterness. And bitterness has armor. You know, God has armor. And we're going to be teaching about the armor of God. Well, Satan is a counterfeiter and he has armor too. And he wants you to stay in self-bitterness. So what does he do? He puts armor around it to keep it strong. So what happens is you do something and you do not forgive yourself. That's called self-unforgiveness. Then you start to replay it. Oh, I can't believe I said that. That's called self-resentment. If you're prone to migraine headaches, they'll start right about here. You can be migraine free in two prayers. Then you start thinking of ways to get even. Self-retaliation. Then you get into self-anger. Oh. And then it moves to self-hatred. Oh, I hate myself. And then it turns to self-violence, cutting, bulimia, uh, 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 what's anorexia. The, anorexia. Yeah. Suicide. Then it moves self -murder. to self-murder. Self-murder. Thinking about it, or saying the world would be better off if I wasn't around. Once you decide that any thoughts of death are from Satan, you will blow the whistle and you will point at it and you will say, I will not consider anything about death. How can you retaliate against yourself? Oh, lots of ways. Um, I blew my diet, so I might as well just eat whatever I want. That would be one way. Yeah, yeah. I will tell you, the best diet in the world, ladies, gentlemen, the best diet in the world is stop calling yourself fat. <laughs> Simply. Because you eat the fruit of the words that you speak. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 
point out that self-murder isn't necessarily... Uh, Thank you. Keep it up. Come on. Say it. <laughs> because once you decide that you're worthless, once you decide that you don't deserve... Yeah. You're, you're basically killing the self that yeah. created you to be. Yeah. That's right. And then, then you give in to that completely. And that's why you know, some people lose themselves in yeah. that, to that way. Yeah. That's why we see people still lost. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. And then Jesus said, uh, the scripture says, um, do not murder, but I'd say do not even speak evil against you. Amen. You know, Amen. not rock yeah. Yeah. And yeah. That, that was murder. Yes. Because we can murder with our words. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You you can murder with, and, and people are say murderous things. But this is not about what other people do. You have the ability to say, I don't receive that. Somebody can call you the biggest <laughs> and you can look with your spiritual eyes and see that's not that person. That person is letting their body be used by an enemy to voice. Because Satan's spirits they don't have a mouth. They need to find somebody who's willing to let them use their, your, their mouth so that their nature can be come out. See, God wants to bring his nature to earth right through you so that wherever you're at, his nature is abounding. And Satan wants him, <coughs> Satan wants to use you also so that wherever you're at, Satan's nature comes out of you. And fills. I have a bad back. Okay. okay. Spot. Yeah. Thank you fun. for just having the freedom to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so it's important that you decide who you're going to let use your body, who you're going to let use your mouth, and what words are coming out. Because the scripture says, life and death are in the power of the tongue, and you will eat the fruit of the words that you speak. So, let's pray. Think of a way that you have condemned yourself. Uh, you want to get even with yourself. You want to punish yourself. You've gone into addictions uh, to destroy yourself. You've said horrible things about yourself. Pick out something. And let's kill it. <laughs> I want to tell you why I use the word kill. This is so interesting to me when I found this out. That the word decide ends in what? C-I-D-E. That ending means kill. So suicide is to kill. Genocide is to kill. Um, uh, uh, pesticide is to kill and decide is to kill it's to kill off every other choice and to give yourself so completely to the one thing you choose to do which is called self control so is that cool? <laughs> so we're going to decide with our free will to get rid of self bitterness Okay? Father God, in the name of Jesus, I confess I have let self-bitterness into my heart. I have been, and you tell me what it is. I repent. I'm turning back to your way. I, I thank you that I'm forgiven. I forgive myself. In the name of Jesus, I command the tormentors that were assigned to me. When I chose self-bitterness to leave me now and never return. Holy Spirit, heal my heart. Renew my mind. Give me the mind of Christ and tell me the truth.
Anyone sense a spiritual shift? Maybe something shadowy leaving. Maybe chains broken. Maybe a renewing of your mind. Renewing of your mind is a moment by moment daily event. It's not a one time and it's done thing. Anyone want to share? I just heard the words, you're doing good. Yes, good. He encourages and affirms us. All right. Self bitterness. Any way you put yourself down, any memory. Look at this. Ladies and gentlemen, look at this. Any memory that has shame, guilt, regret, or sorrow. So does that mean that you can still look at those memories without regret or sorrow? Yes. So how do you do that? Well, thank you for asking. <laughs> you give it to Jesus. Give what? You give the regret, the, regret sorrow. the sorrow. If you look at 2 Corinthians 7.10, here's what it says. Godly sorrow, and it's a description of two kinds of sorrow. Godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. Repentance leads to forgiveness. And then it says, comma, godly sorrow leads to repentance, comma, with no regret. Worldly sorrow, on the other hand, oh, this one, let me finish. And it leads to life. <laughs> okay. Worldly sorrow, on the other hand, has no forgiveness in it, has no um, it replays over and over and over and over as if it's been happening a million times and it leads to death. So well, people can get addicted to that. Oh sure. Sure. They get their identity from it. Yeah. That's why it's so important. Satan is an identity thief. He does not want you to know who God says you are. He does not want you to agree with God about who you are. He wants you to think you have an identity that is totally different than his. And he wants you to think you're a loser or you're a pain or you should be better off dead. He, that's, all, that's his talk. God says, I have good plans for you. I have, I have plans that to, and I have a way to, to help you succeed in those plans. And then you've got to decide which do you choose. Who do you choose to believe? The killer who wants to destroy you or the one who wants to bring you life? And what kind of sorrow are you carrying? Because God says, I'm not going to add any sorrow to your life. There's a whole lot of people that think it's harder to follow God than it is to follow Satan. And it's the opposite. That's calling good evil and, and evil good. It's way easier and more fun and more delightful to have a life that you follow God. Amen. <laughs> yeah. We know. We've tried it both ways, right? And so once you decide to do it God's way, what happens? You have 1,400 chemicals and 30 hormones in your body, and you have a recipe for life going on in your body. And when you mess up that recipe with thoughts that agree with the enemy, you are destroying yourself. And so that decision that you make, carrying shame, first of all, God never shames. We may be guilty of something, but if we're guilty of something, we can get forgiven. And it would be the ultimate pride to not receive the forgiveness. Oh, what I've done is way too big to be forgiven by God most high. You see how prideful that would sound and be? Instead of humbly receiving forgiveness and being thankful for forgiveness. Because once you're forgiven, he puts it behind his back and he remembers it no more. And only Satan would try to get you to remember it. But you have to know who you are. You have to know you're forgiven. You have to delight in the fact that you're forgiven. Regrets? Oh my goodness! God says, leave the pain of the past. Do you know why he said that? So that you can go on to fruitfulness. 
You cannot go on to fruitfulness if you're replaying your past. It's like dragging. In fact, when we teach it to the kids, we put a bunch of rocks in the backpack and say, here, live your life carrying this junk. <laughs> okay. And the joy of getting rid of the pain of the past is a delightful thing. What would be your motive in keeping self-bitterness? Because self it's all about your motive. What? Self-harm. Yeah. Yeah. You want to prove that you're right. You're no good. Yeah. If, if you come into agreement with the enemy. Sure. Yeah. Because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, that we go towards what we think. We go towards what we, what we repeat in our head. That's why God said, watch out what you're thinking. Pay attention to what you're thinking. Pay attention to what you're looking at. Pay attention to what you're listening to because it's going to affect you. And so that decision to, to um, uh, shamar, shamar means guard. <laughs> That's one thing Adam didn't do. He didn't shamar. He didn't guard what he was told to guard. We're told, we're told we're to guard. We're told to stand at the door and check every thought that comes, tries to come in. I call it check the ID. If you're a bouncer at the bar, you're going to check the ID, right? And if they're not 21, what are you going to say? Get, Get out. You can't come in. That's exactly what you're to be doing with thoughts. Check the ID. If it's from God, come on in. If it's not from God, get out of here. And that's our job. Nobody else is going to do it for you. It's kind of like accusing spirits are like flies. Satan's called Beelzebub. And those accusing spirits are like flies. But you're not going to have somebody else keeping the flies off you. You've got to keep them off yourself. Right? I like to use the example of being in an airplane, being a pilot in an airplane. You have a right to land your plane on that little runway out in the bush. But you have responsibilities. And if you're too far over to the left, you better self-correct. And if you're too far to the right, you better self-correct. Nobody's going to do it for you. And that's how our life is. We've got the kingdom, and we get to choose to walk in it where there's righteousness, peace, and joy. Or we're going to get off track, and we're going to be way over here in the world, and the world is dirty and messy and wants to kill, steal, and destroy us. And the amazing thing is you can get off a little bit, but you go a hundred thousand, you know, you go a thousand miles, you're going to be really far away from where you wanted to be. So paying attention, it's way, I say it's way easier to clean the bottoms of your feet than to clean up the mud up to your neck, right? And so we want to notice, that's why he said pay, in the scripture, there's so many times, I can't remember how many times, but it says pay attention. And he says, Pay attention to the things that are not seen. God looks at the things that are not seen. Satan looks at the outside. God looks at the inside. And so that decision to get rid of, I just want to celebrate. You do not, have, you know, can you imagine having a vessel with no shame, no guilt, no, no regret, no sorrow? It's, it's wonderful. And anyway, you curse yourself, you curse God because He created you, and you're saying, "God, you didn't, you made a mistake." So we don't want to be doing that. Now, vows. Oh my goodness, a vow is a statement that you say all the time, that you live by, and you haven't paid much attention to it. And all of a sudden, you read in the Scripture that you're going to get. Whatever you shall say, you shall have whatever you say. That's Mark 11, 23. In Numbers 14, it says, Just as you have spoken in my hearing, so it will be to you. So I will do. So what are you saying? What are you saying about yourself? Are you saying, oh, well, I'm socially awkward? Or are you saying, oh, it's hard for me to remember stuff? <laughs> Or are you saying, I'm tired all the time? Or are you saying, I just don't know? Or because, my back always hurts. Or my back, yeah. 
If you're saying, I don't know, remember, your God is not the God of confusion. Can I ask you your homework? Do not say, I don't know. <laughs> Especially if you want to know. Ask God. He will tell you. He is not the God of confusion. And he wants to tell you and he's waiting for you to listen. On a phone call, prayer is a phone call to God. Think of it as a phone call to God. Would you sit there and, and only talk and never let the other person talk if you were on the phone? It's, get, it's listening and talking. It's listening and talking. It's listening and talking. This is the first place I ever came to where I prayed and I was told, listen. <laughs> all my prayers before were all about begging, never listening. Now I know it's like, it's called give and take. It's like if you're standing face to face with someone, you talk sometimes and then sometimes you listen. And God will tell you. Um, I, I'm overly sensitive. Okay, anybody? I'm what I'm going to do here is just tweak you because we're going to do a vow prayer. We're going to break a vow that you've lived by that has been destroying your life. I always get a headache when I bump, bump, bump. Or how about this one? Life sucks and then you die. Okay? These are things people say. You've heard of these kind of things. What? My feet are killing me. My feet are killing me. And exactly. Don't say that. Don't that, say that. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Don't say that. What we can do instead, this is not about pretending that your back doesn't hurt or pretending that your feet don't hurt. This is about, listen, Satan throws fiery darts. Picture yourself capturing the dart in midair, turning it around, and throwing it back at the devil killing him with his own weapon. Maybe so you do that you do that by <laughs> praise you do that by praise thanksgiving, praise and worship. Your armor. Shield it, your, fail, your shield of faith but you turn that, you use that you're about to say my feet hurt and then you stop and you say Lord bless my feet. Amen. I give you that pain and I thank you that you're healing my feet. You do that every time your feet hurt, you will find that pain going. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus hung on the cross to carry your pain. He wants you to give it to him. He wants to heal it. He wants to. And you do not, you do not even know when he's going to heal you. I gave a testimony earlier today to Justin about how my thumb had been cut and it was all crooked. And how one day through prayer and praise and it's all working out for me and all the things we do around here, one day my thumb went poof, 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 and it straightened up. Like 20-something years afterwards. Don't put a time frame on things. Know, know that you know that you know. It's in your knower. And that's what faith is. Faith is to be sure of things not seen and certain of things to come. What are you sure of? What are you certain of? Because he said, faith is what pleases God. If you're waiting until you see something, no faith in you. Believe it before you see it. Because he said, walk by faith, not by sight. You cannot possibly see everything. So if you think you know because you saw something, mm -mm. Okay, let's pray. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Time's going too fast for me. Okay, here we go. I want you to break a vow. Has everybody thought of a vow that they say that they're going to quit saying? Okay, all right. Father God, in the name of Jesus, and as an act of my free will, I confess, repent, and come out of agreement with the vow that I've made. Tell me what it is. This vow is in my life and in my generations. Clear back to Adam. 
I ask you, Lord, to forgive me and my family members. And all my past and future generations. For involvement in this battle. I release myself from the curse of this battle. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the power of his blood. I cancel Satan's power over me. Because of this vow that I've lived by. Tell him what it is again. Holy Spirit, heal my heart. Cleanse me from the effects of this vow. And speak your words of truth to me. about yourself. What are your I am statements? God said, I am that I am. What am you? <laughs> Notice, I am what? I am I am the righteousness of God. <laughs> there you go. And because of that, see, your, your true I am statements have to have a second part. Because of who I am, what do I do? Because it's all about what we do. You know, you believe in God, big deal, even the demons believe. What's the difference between a righteousness of God and somebody who is doing? You know? So, I'm, I'm the righteousness of God, so I do this. Okay, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a child of the Most High God, so I live a, a life of peace and joy, regardless of circumstances. So you add that what, who am I and what do I do it's on the stage? It's very important that we add, that we notice the doing part. Okay, I could stay here about four more hours, <laughs> but I know time is up. So I'm going to close here. If you have something you want to pray about, please stay. We have Milo here tonight to pray with you, unless you're running off to the to the. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, your cabin. Where that was the word I was trying to think of. We have Kathy here, and actually, you're all equipped to pray. You grab one of these prayer cards, 
And here's prayer cards right here if you don't have one. Grab a prayer card and sit down and pray with somebody. We're all equipped. It would be a very religious to say that only certain people can pray. That God has equipped all of us to pray. He's equipped all of us to, to have that face-to-face -face relationship with Him. We do prayer here for several reasons. One, and we do it out loud. And I am, I am highly encourage you to do it out loud in your home and in the other place when you're working with people. Um, when Jesus was asked, how do you pray? He didn't say, well, sit there quietly and think this. Mm -hmm. He said, say this. Mm -hmm. Because your brain is actually designed to believe you more than me. You know, anybody you hear, your brain is designed to believe yourself more than you do. And so saying it is very important. The scripture says you're going to eat the fruit of the words you speak. So when you speak out loud who I am and what I do, that's powerful in the neuroplasticity of the brain. So it's very, very important. If you don't have one of these, if you don't have ten of these, get ten. And stick them in your pocket, stick them on your mirror, stick them in the glove compartment of your car, and have them handy. Use them. You, <laughs> you thank you. Them. <laughs> thank you, Carol. It's kind of like buying the book and saying, yeah, I've got the book. Yeah. <laughs> but have you read it? <laughs> Father, we thank you. We thank you for your powerful and active presence. We thank you, Father, for every place in people's hearts that we've touched tonight. And Father, we thank you for your spirit that will seal your work in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Janice, did you say you had a uh, list of those prayer points? Yes. I do. Um, there's a couple of